Good evening. Welcome to the March 14th, 2016 Town Council meeting. Could we have the roll call, please? Council Chair McCausland? Here. Councilor Garvin? Here. Councilor Grennan? Here. Councilor Jordan? Here. Councilor Lennon? Here. Councilor Ray? Here. And Councilor Sullivan? Here. Great. Thank you. Will you join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We have town council reports and correspondence. I have just a couple of things I'd like to mention. The school board has provided the community with an update. It's available on the town website. I'm sure it's available on the school website as well. On their superintendent search, they're expecting to begin interviewing in the next couple of weeks. They're on track to hire a new superintendent by May. I think that's very exciting. I'd also like to thank them for their hard work on that process. I know they are especially busy right now during budget season. <clears throat> I also wanted to mention that former councillor and council chair Jim Walsh has graciously agreed to participate on the Spurwing School Reuse Committee. That group is scheduled to kick off its work on March 28th at 7 p.m. at the Spurwing School, as with every public meeting open to the public. Everyone's welcome to attend. Um, the manager may speak to this as well, but as the liaison to the Conservation Commission, I did want to mention. We do have a couple of green belt trails that are closed right now to all but pedestrian traffic. Um, those two are at Goldcrest and Stonegate. I did want to mention that the Conservation Commission does work very hard at maintaining and upgrading those trails. We have had some very nice feedback, particularly on Goldcrest recently, thanks to the folks on the Conservation Commission, <coughs> all their hard work on keeping those up. That's it for me. Anybody else on the council have anything that they would like to bring up? Yes, Patty. I just have a quick um, thing. Uh, this year we have um, many goals, and one of the um, under communication <coughs> and outreach, um, one of the goals is to continue and expand citizen roundtables to gather citizen input and to encourage a dialogue as part of the um, roundtables. And we have a three-member committee, um, Councillor Garvin, Councillor Levin, and, Levin and myself, and we will be leading this outreach effort. I just wanted to let the council know that we will um, be meeting to make a plan, discuss um, how to move forward, and our first meeting will be on April 4th. Terrific. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, Kathy. I just wanted to uh, update everybody um, on the budget schedule. There should be an extra copy in front of you, but it's also in the packet, and the town council will start uh, reviewing uh, the various accounts this coming Monday and Tuesday. So those are the next two meetings for budget. Thank you. Thanks. Just if I might add to that, all of those meetings are going to be down in the lower level conference room. Good to know. Thank you. Any other council members want to add anything else? No? Okay. Thank you. We'll move on. Finance Committee report. Mike, are you giving us an update on finance tonight? Uh, I, I, I think uh, Chairman Ray of the Finance Committee just gave the budget schedule, and then I'll be waiting to give the municipal budget uh, update later on. But, uh, overall, the, the year, you know, it's in good shape. And, you know, a few surprises with uh, maintenance of equipment, but obviously, uh, other than the fact I saw a few snowflakes on the way here tonight, uh, Me too. it's been a pretty mild winter. And great numbers coming in on those public works budgets. That's good. Those That's good. look terrific. Down 42%, 52%, 29%. <coughs> Kudos and to. people are still buying cars like crazy. Yes, yeah, yeah, those numbers look good too. Okay, thank you. Any questions on finance? No? Great. Citizen opportunity for discussion of items not on the agenda tonight. Do we have some folks who'd like to speak? Yes. Please step right up. Give us your name, address, remember council rules. Please try to limit your remarks to three minutes. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Tammy Walter. I live at 1095 Sawyer Road, um, and uh, I'm the president of the Spurwing Run and Gun Club. Um, uh, dear council members, 
First, thank you, um, Chairman McCausland and council members for recognizing me this evening. Um, there's been a lot of discussion rego regarding my support and Mark Mayon's support of Bill LD 1500, which is a bill to promote and protect sport shooting ranges in Maine. We are proud of the support we have given this bill. I want to make the record clear. We did not initiate this bill. This bill came to us. The support we have given this bill is for the benefit of other shooting ranges in Maine who find themselves encroached on by the selfish interests of people who move within the proximity of shooting ranges and then try by any means necessary to close them down. Our club and its members have always been straightforward regarding our plans. Unfortunately, this cannot be said of a group of neighbors in Cross Hill whose actions some have referred to as disingenuous and conniving. As you know, we plan on opening our 50 meter and 100 yard ranges at some point in the future. Their size will be the same as we previously planned and they will be no blue sky ranges. Our goal is to upgrade our range to fit within our urban environment. We plan on adhering to the shooting range ordinance and our licensing application. We have always been good neighbors and we will continue to do so. We will be better to our neighbors than our neighbors have been to us. We value our town and, and this community that we love. Thank you, counselors, very much for your service to our great community. Thank you. Yes, please step right up. <clears throat> Good evening, Eric Stephanus to Tiger Lily Lane. And um, first, I want to comment on the draft statute just, just discussed and currently before the Maine legislature, uh, LD 1500, an act to protect and promote sport shooting ranges. Then I have a related question about the administration of Cape Elizabeth's firing range ordinance through the firing range committee. The act would make bad law because it seeks to exempt gun club shooting ranges from any other provisions of law and that strips municipalities of the ability to regulate their own affairs. It carves out a special interest and undermines the principle of home rule. This statute, supported by officers of the Spurwink Rod and Gun Club, conflicts with the 2014 Firing Range Ordinance on which the town council spent a great deal of time and taxpayer money. When the vote was taken to authorize the contingent reopening of the Gun Club shooting range last October, the council members stressed a balanced approach which respected the concerns of residents as well as the gun club. Now the gun club seems to be brushing aside that spirit of compromise and seeking a backdoor way through central government regulation to do, to do just as they please. I hope this bill will be defeated in the legislature, but I also believe that the support the gun club has given it presents a problem. The firing range committee has important ongoing functions in the regulation and inspection of the shooting range under sections 8, 10, and 12 of the ordinance. The council relies upon the recommendations of the committee, as we saw last year during the licensing process for the club shooting range, when the council accepted all of the committee's findings of fact. Luckily, on at least one critical point, the issue of safety, the council wisely decided to trust but verify and brought in an independent NRA-approved safety expert who determined that the club shooting, club's shooting range was, as a matter of fact, unsafe. So the problem I see here is this. The firing range committee to date has relied heavily on the advice of Mr. Mayon, the current club representative on the committee, concerning safety and other issues. But he supports LD 1500, which is designed to undermine the firing range ordinance. I can't reconcile in my mind entrusting someone to administer a town ordinance when they are at the same time maneuvering to nullify that ordinance through their support of legislation which would do just that. Arguing a point is one thing, but trying to thwart the town's authority is another. This seems to me a clear conflict of interest. So in conclusion, I believe a review of the composition and functioning of the firing range committee is called for to ensure that the committee can effectively discharge its duties 
without being subverted by its own members. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak about an item that's not on the agenda? Good evening, counselors. My name is Mark Mayone from the Spurwink Spur Run and Gun Club. As, as some of you may know, we recently got notice that our tax status has changed. We are a nonprofit organization. For 61 years, we didn't pay taxes. We recently got word that we would soon have a $4,200 a year tax bill. Please keep in mind that due to the ordinance the town required of us, <clears throat> we have spent over $110,000 and only opened a small portion of our range. Our annual income from dues is only $18,000 a year. We still owe money to contractors, earth workers, our attorney, and a club member. After we get noticed that we would start paying taxes, we ask the task assessor to please send us the emails involved in our tax situation. Of course, we guess that the Cross Hill group that constantly fights us against, uh, if constantly fights against us was behind this, and we were right. In the over 80 emails, we found two especially disturbing emails that I would like to read to you. These emails were addressed to Town Manager Michael McGovern and Tax Assessor Matthew Sturgis. September 15, 2015. Good morning, Mike. Is there a reason why the gun club does not pay taxes? Has the basis for this historic decision been revisited recently? Seems unfair that the most disruptive organization in town contributes nothing to our tax base. Perhaps a lawyer who specializes in tax law could look at the assumptions behind this waiver. Best, Sarah Lennon. Here's the second email written by Sarah Lennon. I suppose while you're researching this question, Matt, it's worth determining if they actually owe us 60 years of back taxes. Best, Sarah Lennon. It's very upsetting and disappointing that an elected town councilor interfered with the official tax duties of our tax assessor. And Sarah Lennon was recently quoted as saying she wants to work with the club. Well, this doesn't sound like Sarah Lennon wants to work with our club. This sounds like Sarah Lennon wants to bury our club. On Sarah Lennon's Facebook page, she rants anti-gun, anti-NRA positions. She even goes so far as to say to her friends, quote, anyone want to travel down to D.C. next weekend and join the march for gun control? I'm in, end quote. She calls our club the most disruptive organization in town, and then she makes sure she puts herself on the firing range committee, the committee that has input to the town council in matters dealing with the shooting range, Spurwink Run and Gun Club. Coincidentally, now that our club is trying to give equal access to our archers, Sarah Lennon has actively tried to eliminate bow hunting in Cape Elizabeth. For these reasons, we would like to ask that Council Lennon recuse herself from any dealings concerning the Spurwink Running Gun Club. Thank you very much for listening, and thank you for your service. May I respond to Thank you. Uh, uh, um, <clears throat> we have a protocol on that, yes? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Number one, when I wrote those emails, I was not a town council, I was a private citizen, September. I wasn't elected until November. My quote in the Cape Courier, I hoped, made clear that as a town councilor, my role would be very different than a citizen. Number two, I'm happy to get off the firing range if you all think that I'm biased in some way. I happen to agree that perhaps you should consider getting off as well. Maybe we should have completely unbiased citizens on the committee. And number three, um, I actually do believe it's fair that you should pay property taxes. Every other organization in town, I apologize for saying you were disruptive, every other organization in town, private citizen and everyone else pays taxes, why would you be exempt? So, and, and fourth, I, I think it's no one's business what's on my Facebook page. By the way, I believe those were posted several years ago, again, when I was not elected official. So I take exception to several of your personal attacks on me. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Anyone else who would like to speak about an item not on the agenda tonight? No? We'll move on. Thank you. Town Manager's monthly report. Yes, uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Chair McLaughlin. First, uh, I would like to talk about the Spurring Rod Gun Club for a minute. Uh, one of the council goals was to get a report on the status of the Spurring Rod Gun Club. And I do want to 
Uh, ben McDougall, the Code Enforcement Officer, wrote a very brief report. Uh, it's nice once in a while you get a brief report. And maybe it's so short, maybe I'll just read it uh, so that everyone's aware of what it says. It was dated uh, March 1. Uh, it's from Ben McDougall, the Code Enforcement Officer, addressed to me. And he simply wrote, on October 14, 2015, the Town Council approved the license application of the Sporting Rod and Gun Club, conditioned upon the final certification being made by the Code Enforcement Officer regarding compliance with four sections of the shooting range ordinance. On December 18, 2015, the Code Enforcement Officer certified compliance with the four sections of the ordinance, and the police chief allowed live fire to resume on the 25-yard range. Since live fire has resumed on the range, I've received two inquiries regarding the Sporting Rod and Gun Club. The first was a request for a copy of the range manual. Uh, he's actually got many requests from the same individual for that. That's my aside. Uh, but continuing it with his, the town did not receive a copy of the range manual, but Spurman Rod and Gun Club did provide a list of weapons allowed to be discharged from the 25-yard range, which is an excerpt from the range manual. The second inquiry is regarding the control of ingress and egress at the shooting range. Based on my inspection and the report by Rick LaRosa, I have determined that access to the shooting range facility is secured and controlled in a manner that meets the requirements of the ordinance. Other than the preceding items, I'm not aware of other complaints or issues regarding the shooting range ordinance. So, so that was his report. I also would like to mention there was a suggestion that uh, in the public comments that the council look at the makeup of the uh, shooting range committee. And in fact, uh, the ordinance committee is doing that. You're going to be meeting, you remember the date? I was, I was looking it up for to have After during that, yeah. correspondence time, and it's not on the website, and I didn't want to say okay. the wrong date and time without having it verified in front of me. So unless Jessica might have it on her, I don't. There is a meeting coming up. It will be posted relatively soon on the website, it's, and there will be a draft uh, that uh, will be put together uh, prior to the meeting for the committee. Do you know, do you know the date? I do. It's Thursday, March 24 at 1.30 p.m. Yeah, Thursday, March 24 at 1.30. And that we'll be looking at the makeup of the Fire and Range mm -hmm. Committee in specific uh, to see, you know, what it should be going forward. Uh, also, as long as I'm talking about the, the uh, Rod Gun Club, you know, LD 1500 uh, has did have a legislative hearing uh, before the Judiciary Committee. It was reported out uh, by a strong vote that it ought to pass. Uh, it was subsequently uh, reviewed again by the committee, had a slight change uh, in, in the, the bill, but it, it's, to my knowledge, it still hasn't been reported fully out of the committee. Is that your understanding? Yes. Okay. It still hasn't been reported out of the committee. But we expect eventually it will be reported out, out, out of the committee and that it, you know, it probably will be approved in some form. It's, it's a little bit premature to know exactly what the final bill is going to say. Uh, you never know until they come out of the committee and the, the, legis the full legislature uh, votes on them. Uh, the town, uh, town officials have, including myself, have expressed concern to the committee. I wrote a letter saying that we, we did feel that it was uh, usurping municipal authority and it, uh, also shared that with the, the representatives of uh, the Rod Dunn. The hearing uh, in Augusta on the bill was fairly interesting. And, you know, uh, the Cape Elizabeth situation appeared to be of, of a lot of interest to members of the committee, and they seemed specifically concerned that there, there'd been some overreaching in Cape Elizabeth, uh, particularly when the insurance for the Gut Rod Gun Club was in fact canceled after residents called the insurance company asking for their insurance to be canceled. And, and also uh, with, uh, you know, other activities that had gone on, including a grant that was, had been applied for and there was law against the grant. So I, I just caution everyone on this issue. Uh, you know, no matter what side you're on, sometimes when you overreach, some, a consequence happens that you don't necessarily intend. I think, you know, some of the, the you know, I understand that, you know, you, certain people are upset with Sarah Lennon's comments, I, under, I understand that certain residents haven't been happy with the gun club. But, you know, overall, you know, the gun club has acted very cooperatively in dealing with the town. Uh, they acted cooperatively with the firing range ordinance. Uh, we now have what we believe is a safe range as a result of a lot of work by a lot of people, including the gun club, including the neighbors, and including uh, 
the council and, and other municipal officials. So I would just hope that some of the rhetoric could be toned down and that, uh, you know, we look at the, the real issues of, of the gun club and, you know, that's that it's safe, that, you know, obviously while we don't regulate noise, we hope, we hope that the gun club is sensitive to noise and that, uh, you know, everyone try to be as good neighbors as they can be. So, thank you. Anything and continue else? on other yes. topics, yeah. Please do. Good. I uh, also want to mention, uh, that's all I'm going to say about the Rod Gun Club. If anyone wants to leave that doesn't want to, I'm afraid I'm going to say more because I'm not. Uh, I, I do want to mention, I heard from Peter Gleason, the fire chief, this morning uh, that we've had two recent resignations from the Cape Elizabeth Rescue Unit. Uh, the two of particular note. Uh, Dick Groton, who's a former captain of the, the rescue, and Steve Peters, who's also another captain. Uh, both of them apparently are, are about to move to other communities. Both of them are moving to Scarborough, like a lot of people do, uh, or plan to move relatively soon. And together, Peter says they have over 70 years of service. I'm not sure if it's wow. not a lot more than that. I think Dick, you know, was a, at least been a member of the rescue unit since 1980, and you know, I'm not sure about Steve, but. They both provided tremendous service uh, to the rest of the company over the years, and as Peter says, we appreciate the contributions, and both will be missed by Peter as well as company members. And they've done a lot of good for the town, and want to praise them. Uh, the one other point I wanted to mention is, you know, the town. A lot of us were saddened by the passing uh, a week or so ago of John Malley, and John Malley, for those that, that didn't know him. Uh, was, was a lot of help to the farmers in Cape Elizabeth, uh, particularly during the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, he, he did an awful lot of work with crop rotation instruction, with soil preservation of soils, uh, with, with drainage. For example, there's, there's a good sized drainage project over in the Westfield area. All these berms there, John was involved with that. And, and, and again, I don't usually read aloud things, but the Cumberland County Soil and Water Conservation District on their website uh, featured uh, a little piece about John I'd like to read it. It was with a heavy heart that we share the news of the loss of a beloved friend of the district, John Malley. John was a pillar of the district for more than 40 years, first as a partner with the Natural Resources Conservation Service, and then as an associate supervisor for 25 years until his retirement in 2010 when he was named Supervisor Emeritus. John gave us the gift of himself, his energy, enthusiasm, honesty, respect, and wisdom, and he taught us how to give it back. His leadership helped us deal with the many challenges and opportunities that presented themselves over the years. He downplayed his part in the district's success, but we all know that his utter commitment to our work and to our people played a large role in our success. He was indeed part of the lifeblood of this district. We consider ourselves lucky to have known John and learned from him. Carolyn Jordan, our board supervisor, put it best when she said, those of you who knew John are aware of what a wonderful man he was. For those of you who did not have a chance to know our supervisor emeritus, you missed a chance to know a true gentleman. He will be missed. And, you know, I, I'm one of those that was very happy to know John, uh, you know, for the work he did in Cape Elizabeth, as well as I, I think everyone's aware that Bob Malley, the director of public works, uh, is, 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 was, is John's son. And, uh, uh, you know, I want to express my uh, deep sympathies to Bob and to the whole Malley family, to, uh, to uh, Irene Malley. Uh, they lived on Crescent View Avenue for a long, long time and had moved in recent years down to the Breakwater condos, but just a, a very fine person. And I think when you, when, you, when you read the traits of John, you can see a lot of them in Bob. And uh, he's a very nice man and will be missed. So. Our condolences to Bob Malley as well. That's it. Thank you. Okay. We will move on to the review of the draft minutes of the February 8th, 2016 meeting. Does everyone have a copy of those meeting minutes? Yes. Do we have a motion to accept them? Jessica. I move that we accept the February 8th, 2016 draft minutes. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Kathy. Any discussion? No? All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. We're halfway through our agenda already, and it's only 7:25. All right. We'll move on to item number 46-2016, Harbor Master Services. Mike, will you introduce this item for us? I'd be happy to. Uh, as I think everyone in the room is aware, 
Uh, it, there's a proposal before you to contract with the town of Scarborough for Harbor Master Services. This takes the form of, a, of an interlocal agreement, uh, wh whereas Scarborough would provide certain services, certain, certain number of hours for, for a set fee. The approximate cost is $5,500 per year. Uh, this compares to $4,000 for the current very part-time hired Harbor Master. Uh, Neil and I, the, the chief, chief, Neil Williams and I have discussed this, and uh, he actually appoints the Harbor Master, and we believe this is the best approach uh, because we'll have a Harbor Master uh, that uh, is a sworn police officer, uh, will, has been uh, also a Marine Patrol officer for the state of Maine, recently uh, retired in that capacity. Uh, he'll have not only one boat available to him, but two boats uh, to be able to patrol in the harbor. Uh, has much expertise in the area. Uh, and, you know, I think it's, it's a real opportunity to improve the level of service uh, that we're providing to both the commercial interests as well as to the, to, to the recreational interests. It also potentially saves us, you know, additional expense Later on, at one point, I think the council recalled we were going to buy a boat, mm -hmm. uh, and we didn't. And you know, now we're, we're actually through this 5,500, uh, paying for you know a portion of the cost of, of the Scarborough boat uh, boats. In uh, the, the other point is, you know, I do think it's very important that the the community that who, interested in this topic have a chance to meet with the new harbor master if, if this is the direction we go, and discuss all all issues involving the program. And we, uh, the chief working with the, the prospective harbor master has scheduled a uh, May 23rd meeting at 5 p.m. at the police station uh, for anyone who has any interest, comments, wishes to, to meet the individual uh, to uh, exchange views and to uh, share knowledge. So we, we are hoping uh, the council approves this. Chief Williams is here to answer any detailed questions you might have since he has actually had all the direct conversations with Scarborough on this. Okay. And do we have any members of the public who would like to speak on this issue? Chairman. Before we, yeah. Point yes. of board, uh, information. Yes. I was just going to say, before um, we hear from the citizen, uh, I think you misspoke. It's May. Uh, you said May and March 20th. Oh, yeah. I wrote May, too. It's March. Yeah. It's March. I was thinking that was pretty far out. March. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't. Spring. What time? Thank you, Jamie. Yep. Thank you. March. Um, <clears throat> I'm Tom Dunham, and we live on <clears throat> 11 Becky's Cove Lane, and we have a mooring in front of our house. It's um, dated for the property we own back to 1898. <clears throat> and, you know, I'm all for regionalization, as I'm sure many of you know that. But <clears throat> I just would like to have some thought here as, from my perspective, in particular where our mooring is, <clears throat> we have reefs within 25 feet of my mooring, and I can squeeze in there, <clears throat> and I have had no problems over the years, and primarily because of local knowledge with the, <clears throat> my neighbors, uh, knowing what the bottom is and the tides, and <clears throat> having a competent uh, person um, tend to my mooring on an annual basis. So <clears throat> I would just like to have suggest consideration for uh, someone local that knows the waters, uh, fishermen or lobstermen, and <clears throat> that their, their views be considered. And if there is someone in town that <clears throat> has a keen interest in fulfilling this position, then they should be considered. Maybe there isn't any, I, I, I don't know, but um, it's a very localized um, chore. And I, <clears throat> I think the other concern was if you hire someone locally, is he going to be fair and equitable? And, and uh, I think in today's society that uh, it would be unusual that if you hire the right person that he would be, um, have the um, integrity to fulfill his commitments. So I, I would ask that before you make your final decision that I, I don't know if people in the industry have uh, had an opportunity for an open discussion or not, but I think it would be beneficial. And I mean, <clears throat> people that are lobstermen that are up and down the coast every day. Because this, this is, <laughs> it's, it's rather unforgiving out there with a rock-bound coast, and um, no one knows it better than I do. Thank you. Thank you.
uh, Jody Jordan, 83 Old Ocean House Road, Cape Elizabeth. I ask you again to please look, see if you can't find somebody local. We asked you last month and nothing happened. Maybe the new guy would be fine. Maybe we should have a meeting with him before you vote. I mean, but it's nice, it'd be nice to see him or see what he has issues, what his problems are, what his issues are, what, what he plans on doing before you vote on it. So we, could have, we might be fine with it, but we have no idea what's going on right now. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Ed Perry. I live at 10 Pine Ridge Road. Uh, I basically like to reiterate both what Tom Dunham said and what Jody said. Uh, it's kind of interesting when you, if you have a captain's license, uh, one of the things that the Coast Guard does is they ask you a lot of questions about navigation and so on, and, and they finally come out with the final statement on multiple choice questions is, uh, they give you all these ways of interpreting information for your navigation problem, and the one that tops everything else is local knowledge. The local knowledge is the answer to any questions that you have that you have any doubt about. It's always the local knowledge. But I think that the situation here is not so much local knowledge as it was just a communication. And it was wonderful to actually get a letter from the police department a couple of weeks ago saying that, yeah, we're going to have a meeting March 23rd. Uh, here's your application forms. Here's when they're due. And it's information that we hadn't gotten for two or three years. It was really nice to see uh, that maybe the communication was going to improve. Uh, for anybody who's had a boat, you know, you've probably heard the lo lo latest joke, boat, break out another thousand. And you're sitting there in your living room, and it's a dark, stormy night, and it's blowing. And the only thing that's holding your thousands of dollars of investment is that little piece of chain and that little rock on the bottom. And you hope it's in good condition, and you hope it's in the right place. All I've got to say is I hope that if we make any other changes with the harbor master, that the people who have all that money invested get to have some input first. I'm glad that we have the meeting. I hope we're going in the right direction. It sounds good. I hope it works out. I hope we get more chances for input. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Is there anyone else who would like to speak? No? OK. <clears throat> Do we have a motion on item number 46, 2016, on Harbor Master Services? Yes, Kathy, thank you. I move that we approve the contract with the Town of Scarborough for shared Harbor Master services. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Jessica. Discussion? I have a comment. Yes. You know, I'm not sure what's, are you authorizing the signing of the interlocal agreement or you're just approving the concept? I'm a little unsure what the motion made. I'm sorry, I didn't I say it, it right then. Agreement. I was, I was um, making a motion to approve the interlocal agreement. Yes, is that, Michael, is that satisfactory? I was, just, I was just asking. No, no. <clears throat> yeah. And no. Jessica, is, is that it? what you seconded? Yes, thank you. Discussion? Yes, Caitlin. Well, I'm still not clear on the answer to Mike's question. Are you approving it as a concept? or approving it as a signature ready? Well, the council can approve the contract in terms of who the harbor master is. That's up to um, Neil and Michael. That's not uh, something the council does. I'm not sure I'm under, is that what you're asking or no? No, I'm asking, it, <clears throat> like, are you approving the concept that this wording is fine? Or are you saying we're ready to go Mike signed this and hired the Scarborough Harbor Master. I'm saying that I'm asking to approve the interlocal agreement that Michael wrote between us and Scarborough. Is that, did I answer, did I answer the question that time? Right, that you want to move forward with it as yes, a I, signed 
Yes, I do. Okay. Yep. And Jessica, that's yep. what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. Correct. That's what I intended to second. Thank you. Perfect. And then can I move on to the next comment? I, I would like to see what comes of the meeting of March 23rd before we move forward. I know having the agenda go out on Thursday, I heard, I, I sent out word to the people that I knew that had moorings, and they were disappointed that they weren't going to be able to get together and have a meeting before this was going to be voted on by the town council. It seems kind of silly, the last meeting we made, had a discussion about being able to reach out to mooring holders and talk to them and get their points of view, and, and here we're already back to this sign sealed and ready for delivery contract, and we still haven't actually sat down and had that meeting with the people that this is going to most affect. We're basically saying we're going to sign this and then have a meeting to talk to them next week. It just seems like our whole open communication thing we've been working on for years is kind of being averted and, and done a little backwards this time. I mean, we've never had such a prime example of a pinpointed group of people that we could have reached out to and asked for their input before we got to a, a vote. I just think it's not something that we've been working towards for the last few years. So. Thank you. Other comments? Yes, Patty? <clears throat> yeah, my question is this, uh, point in process, I guess it, it does make sense to me a little bit to have this group meet and have a communication, but just to be clear, we're, with this interlocal agreement, would, is the harbor master in Scarborough has been, he is already, it's one person that's already been, been on for hire, and, or he's been, would be hired. And would the people of Cape Elizabeth <coughs> and the people involved not know who this person is already? Isn't there some sense of who this person is and there's some way to share what his qualifications are and those kinds of things to help this? Neil, would you come up and speak to that question? <coughs> yes, uh, his, his name is Ian Anderson and he, to my knowledge, was a Marine Patrol uh, officer in this particular area. And uh, just to correct Mike a little bit, he didn't retire. He chose to take the Scarborough job when it came available. Um, prior to um, all this coming about, uh, what happened was um, I had heard that the Scarborough Harbor Master, Dave Corbeau, was retiring. Therefore, I knew a new one was coming on board. And that's when I approached Chief Moulton and I said, do you think that this is feasible, knowing that the council has always tried to push for collaborative effort? And I believe that's one of your goals. And uh, what I wanted to do is approach Robbie, Chief Moulton, before um, this came to light, because then he could use that as a question or questions in his hiring process as to you know, do you think that this would work? Do you have any issues with it? Do you have any knowledge um, of Cape Elizabeth? And uh, Robbie thought it was a great idea. And um, then when they finally did come down to hiring um, Ian Anderson, uh, it was, he brought Ian over and we had a meeting and I asked him those questions as well and he thought it was a great mix. Uh, in, in the meantime, uh, I had the current harbor master, Walt Gibson, come in and we had a sit down meeting and I informed him of what I was looking at and what I was going to present to the council and to Mike and he thought that that was a heck of an idea. Uh, I did look at the last council meeting and we hear this communication issue and evidently there was a communication issue, I, I, I believe Mr. Perry, when he said that he had a communication issue. I believe that this will be solved. Now we have a harbor master that doesn't necessarily work with us full time, but he's on full time, 40 hours a week. <coughs> Mr. Perry wants to contact him, pick that phone up, bing, you got him over in Scarborough. Might be in Scarborough at the time, but I think he'll, I believe he will get back to Mr. Perry in due time. And also, he's got an email and big thing, got a boat. 
<laughs> so if Mr. Perry has an issue, or his, I believe it's Nate is your son, if Nate had an issue with that aquaculture, needed somebody to look at it, he can be right there looking at the problem. Therefore, I think that this is a good solution. Trying to help out, we had the problem with the aquaculture. We had a nice meeting. We worked it out. Everybody was there. And I think that that would have been a great solution to have a harbor master that could actually look at it from the water and, and have his two cents in it. And, you know, it would have been a lot better. Thank you. Yes, sir. To me, this just feels like a timing issue. I mean, it does. It sounds like a great solution. I, we all are really, really on board with, you know, municipal sharing. This person sounds like it's going to be great that he's on call, everything you say. But I do, I do agree with Caitlin that I think it would be more respectful to hold the meeting where the people who are directly affected by this get to meet the guy. I mean, I, I just, that's no skin off our back. Why can't we just delay this vote for a month and let them meet, get feedback from them? I mean, I, I suspect they'll be incredibly cooperative and appreciative. They're all really nice men. And then it feels like the process has been open and listening and respectful. Doing it this way feels to me like we're, we're preempting citizen input. So uh, to me, it's just, what's the downside of waiting a month to vote on this again, to vote on this? If I could, I, I would just like to say something, and I typically wait until everyone has had a chance to speak on the council. But I do want to be clear. <clears throat> I think what we're being asked to address tonight is the interlocal agreement. And it's not the council's responsibility to get involved in a hiring decision. So I don't think it's up to us to say, hold off for another month until folks in town have a chance to have a conversation with either Neil or with a potential town employee. I think our job is to stay focused on the issue at hand, which is the interlocal agreement, and we can debate that issue, but whether or not we ask Neil to, to have a, a different employee, I, I think that's out of bounds for our discussion, and I think that's a conversation that Mike might have with Neil, and Neil might have with folks in town, but I don't think that is the council's responsibility to get involved in a personnel issue. And if, and if I could, I, um, the harbor master, do, I, I'm not a harbor master. I'm, I'm not a marine guy. I'd first be the first person to admit it. Okay, maybe know how to operate a boat a little bit, maybe not around Cape Elizabeth, maybe in a lake or something. But uh, anyway, what, what I'm getting at is um, I've listened and heard what some of the lobstermen have said. That's why we're at the point we are now in looking at something better. And I've heard the communication issues before. I've heard not anybody in the area. That's what I'm trying to address already. And I think we've done it that, that way. And, and I guess I'm a little remiss in not contacting the lobstermen, but when we did the collaborative effort with the animal control officer with South Portland, we, I mean, we didn't contact dog owners and say, what do you think? You know, and I know it's, I know it's totally different than a license and a boat. I, I understand there's a lot of money on the end of it. And, and I appreciate what Mr. Perry says about the mooring and the chain and stuff like that, because that's why we like to have people inspect it. Now, if a lobsterman has an expensive boat or his boat or her boat on a mooring, I guarantee you that they've already inspected it. I have no problem with the lobstermen because I know they're going to inspect their, their moorings and their chain and stuff. But you have to have policy and you have to have things in place. So anyway, that's, that's how I came to my conclusion about Scarborough, attempting to correct the problems that I thought the lobstermen were having. And you do think that this gentleman you're talking about, or the town of Scarborough has already employed, and we're talking about in the interlocal agreement, does have familiarity with the Cape Elizabeth waters? I was told that he was Marine Patrol officer in the area. So if he was Marine Patrol officer in the area, and, and my understanding is, is that he was one of the subjects that looked at the aquaculture. So, so I, I would say yes. Thank you. And Mike, did you want there to say something else? There were counselors with hands up, so I would defer. 
Thank you. I was just going to say, I, I don't think that the council, certainly I'm not looking at this from the perspective of trying to step into a personnel issue. Um, unfortunately, the two are inextricable because you're talking about an agreement for which there's somebody already in place in the job. So um, it, it's, I don't, I don't think, again, certainly from my perspective, and I, I don't want to put words in the mouth of the other councillors, but I, I don't think what we're suggesting is that um, councillors want to roll in picking the person. Um, but when that person's already in place and this agreement would, would um, you know, be de facto a, a hire from that perspective, um, they're kind of intertwined. I want to ask a point of clarification of Chief Williams, and that is, so are you suggesting that at the meeting that's scheduled for the 23rd that you're expecting just to hear more of what you've heard already that's led you to this point of view and, and recommendation versus really hearing any new and additional information? I've kind of laid everything out that I was going to play, put at the meeting that particular day on why we made the decision on doing that. One of the things I, I haven't said to you that I would say that night um, is that I just think it's a lot of pressure to put on somebody on, that has a local, not, not a local knowledge, but is a local person down there in the cove or any place around the around Cape Elizabeth as far as moorings go. It's just, you know, can I move my mooring? Can I do that? Can I do that? It just puts a lot of pressure on somebody to do that. And if they're not the type of person that can handle that type of pressure, it, it goes for naught. And, you know, I'm, I'm finding that out now because I'm now doing all the paperwork. And I'm looking into, um, and, and I think if Mr. Perry doesn't mind, he's a good example of he wanted another mooring. The previous harbor master never knew that the person that owned that mooring had given it up. So therefore, he, the harbor master, then doesn't, doesn't know, so he, he tells Mr. Perry, you can't have that, when in fact it's already been given up. So we're finding that the communication issue is a two-way street and I really think it will be handled a little bit better um, especially with um, the police department office handling it myself and Ed Hahn are trying to funnel all the information into a spreadsheet and and uh, correct that issue um, and and you know payment and and who's got what mooring so I've already found out that there's at least five moorings, I think four or five moorings that people don't have any. Uh, so, so it's good for me to get a hands on and they can call me at any time. Uh, but I think that they will be happy to know that for 40 hours a week they can probably pick up the phone and call Scarborough and get the Harbor Master and get a straight opinion from him. Thank you. Caitlin. <coughs> Sorry. Um, I don't think anybody's having a question with, you know, this is obviously a much better route than what we've had. Um, I, and to what you were saying about how we're not picking, we kind of are, we're either agreeing to go this way and we're going to go with Scarborough or we throw this out and then we kind of force Neil to have to find somebody local or whoever will ever apply for this job because it's not one that he gets many applications for. But. Um, my point as to hearing from the, the mooring holders before we go through with this is something might come up. Like in this interlocal agreement, it says that the harbor master is going to spend 130 to 155 hours, and that shall include time for inspections of moorings. Does that mean that this new harbor master is going to be doing the mooring inspections so that all the mooring holders do not need to hire somebody to have their moorings inspected? No. But it says... It says mooring inspection, but your mooring inspection, I think, is different than what it says there. Once again, not a marine person and, and saying he, he will be there if somebody has an issue about their mooring. Okay, mooring so like, that's something that I think would need to be vetted out and addressed because as you read it, it says, you know, shall include inspection of moorings and harbors. So one would read this and think you're going to inspect the moorings because that's exactly what several of them commented to me and wanted clarification on. So I was just thinking if we had the conversation, I'm not saying this is a bad way to go. I just think 
it seems like we're doing things out of order. Let's have the conversation and then let's hear what they have to say. What else needs to go in here that we're not thinking of or we're not clarifying that should be before we enter it is all think, I'm addressing. I think the manager yeah, would like to respond yeah. to that. Is having been involved in the draft of the interlocal agreement, the interlocal <coughs> agreement responsibilities were exactly premised on what's in our harbor's ordinance. And the harbor master's duties within our harbor's ordinance are listed as doing that. And, and that, that's, why, that's why that particular language is there. You know, I look at this, I, th I think, I think the, the police chief has answered most of the questions very well. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's much better service, it's 40 hour service, it's, it's an independent view, someone who's not caught in the internal politics of harbors as, as we sometimes have, as we've seen with a number of appeals we've had, someone that's gonna have the proper equipment, someone that will have this, even the sounding equipment in the boat, uh, so that, uh, you, know, you know, much more expertise than with, in technology than we've ever had. Uh, you know, and we, we have listened to the complaints for the last several years. And this, this is an attempt to take all of those complaints and to come up with a new workable system to accomplish addressing all those issues. Uh, you know, beyond that, you know, I, I agree with you know, the, the, the appointment of the harbor master position itself, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not a council decision, nor is it a popularity contest amongst those to be served, those to be regulated. You know, certainly we just hired a code enforcement officer. We didn't have all the contractors come in and look for, look for the one that would best suit their needs. We're looking for a harbor master that meets all of the community needs, that has a sense of the law, that has a sense of the coast. And you know, we think particularly, uh, you know, with a gentleman who's been a, a coastal marine patrol warden, uh, you know, has, has expertise, has the familiarity with the coast. Now, they don't know everything about the coast, but this needs to be a cooperative agreement. But the harbor master we have now, I, I, you know, doesn't have a boat. It, and, uh, you know, it, it, we, we're going from, you know, a, a uh, I got to be careful. You get quoted in the newspaper, and then it gets out of context. You know? Yes, yes, you will. We're going from you know a, a 1950s style approach to a 2000 approach. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the council goals up there is to seek opportunities for personnel sharing. Uh, I can't read uh, the neighboring <laughs> communities. You know, this is the perfect opportunity, uh, perfect timing. It's also perfect timing to, to get going on it because the season when people want, are going to want moorings is right on top of us. Uh, and you know, there's, there's many other issues to be resolved. I, I think it's time to do it. You know, I think we'll, we'll, we'll have a terrific meeting uh, with, with all those parties who are interested and begin to know all the issues. And I, I think you know, it's kind of awkward to have a meeting when you haven't signed up with Scarborough and you know, have them come over here and say, oh, by the way, we don't want you. Uh, you know, that, that's not the way I want to deal with Scarborough. Thank you. Yes. Uh, uh, this is the last time I'll speak. I, I, I think we all intend to vote for this. It sounds like the perfect solution. I give you guys huge kudos. You've, you've, you've checked a lot of boxes in this one thing. The only reservation I have is a, a former boss of mine once said process is 95% of success. It, it's, you gotta, you got to attend to process. And if these, people, these got, people have repeatedly asked us, can we meet with them? I don't think they're going to grill him. I don't think they're going to make sure that he's addressing all of their personal quirks and needs. I think they just want to meet the guy and sort of make sure that he passes a straight face test, especially given that they weren't so happy with the former one. That just doesn't seem onerous to me. Why can't we just have the meeting, get their blessing, or not blessing, but get a little feedback and then say it sounds good? Or, or is there something very pressing about doing it right now this month? But, but Sarah, aren't, aren't you asking them to weigh in on it? And here we're talking about we've already got that in place. I frankly don't know which way you want me to go when you say that. I'm not asking them to veto your choice. I'm just asking that, that we are inclusive in our approach and we, and we include community members who are directly impacted by a decision. I don't see the downside of that. I don't think they're going to veto the thing. My question, I guess, would be is, do I bring them in, in as hired or do I bring them in as not hired? Can it just be an informal gathering where people chat? Yes, Caitlin. I'm pretty sure the morning holders weren't even asking to meet him. They just wanted to have a meeting where they were talked to about this idea. 
and have their voices heard about entering into a contract in general. Say he hasn't even been hired. Just the mere fact that we're going to go from our 1950s way of doing things, which has been done for a while, and we're now going to move over here, is a change in the community, whether it's a personnel thing or not. It's a total change in how we do things. And we didn't ask the people that it's going to affect the most what they thought about it. That's, I think, the issue. They're, they're not asking to meet with the guy and grill him about questions. They just wanted their concerns about what's happening in the harbors to be taken into consideration when we move from 1950s to 2000. Again, I'm just going to say this one more time. I think the council is being asked to comment and vote on the draft <coughs> interlocal agreement, and it's not our job to be involved in a hiring decision. So I would like to move for a vote at this point. Yes. Did you have another comment? I, I have comments, yeah. I do too. I haven't spoken yet. Really? You didn't? Oh, you I, I made the, made the, the motion. lousy okay. motion, but I haven't spoken. <laughs> Same I, here. I'll take a couple more comments, but I want to stay focused on the issue at hand because if we want to get involved in, a, in for example, delaying this for another month, I think we need a motion if that's the direction that we want to head in or an amendment to the motion on the floor. So uh, I'll take two more comments and then if we want to have a motion or an amendment to the existing motion, we'll take that. Go ahead. Okay. A uh, couple things. Um, I'd like to commend the town manager and the police chief for uh, going forward with this because it's certainly clear to me that they are they feel the need for increased professionalism. Um, we have learned that there have been significant communication problems to the extent that a counselor illegally signed a permit application. We have had, we have learned of these problems. The town is looking for a professional solution. I'd like to remind the council that Article 3, Section 4 states Council not to interfere in appointments or removals. Neither the council nor any of its members shall direct or request the appointment of any person to his or her removal from office by the manager or by any of the town manager's subordinates. So the question before us, the motion, is to, what, to approve or not approve this interlocal agreement. We did this with a tax assessor. It was very successful. We had no discussion like this when we approved the tax assessor. I think that we are uh, uh, bound by our town charter to proceed as it directs us. And I'd like us to move forward with that vote. Thank you. And thank you in particular for bringing out that language. That's very helpful. Yes, Kathy. Um, I'm going to be supporting this. Um, I, I think that it's very important that we move forward. There's nothing precludes um, folks that are affected of having meetings today, tomorrow, you know, a month from now, um, and airing whatever concerns they have, whether it's um, with the police chief or the new harbor master or whomever. Um, I think it's very important, I, as Mike pointed out last um, month, that it's good for us to have a more robust program that we have, I think um, some folks in the audience have already pointed out that um, it, our program needs to be um, amped up a bit, and um, the police chief has said so, and so is Mike. Um, and that includes securing timely payments of mooring permits. Um, I asked for a copy of the um, report on mooring permits, and there's a lot that are past due. Um, luckily, the police chief sent a recent letter out, and. I guess that's helping since people as recently as today came in and made some mooring payments. So, but those are the kind of things that um, that's money due to the town. Um, the town has every right to expect it. And um, that's the kind of thing that um, somebody who is working, um, you know, on a, not a full-time basis but is available and more available can be uh, making sure that some of those things are happening. So I'll be supporting this. Also very helpful. Thank, Thank you. you. Quick question yes. about the contract itself. I will be supporting it. I think it's, um, it just makes sense after what I've heard tonight, the interlocal agreement. But my question is just quickly about number four property. Um, under that it says that all capital equipment and personal property ut utilized in this program shall remain the property of Scarborough regardless of the source of financing. I'm just a quick question. Why we would, if somehow we were, this is a long agreement, 
to fundraise or buy another boat, why it wouldn't be their property. Michael, will you speak to that? <clears throat> I, the agreement provides that they own the boats, the boats, their responsibility, all those capital equipment. Right. Yeah, and I'm, sure, I'm not sure I understand. It said all the equipment would be regardless of the source of financing. I mean, this is a long-term agreement, like 20 years. I'm yeah. assuming that something could be bought by <clears throat> Elizabeth potentially and it would remain the property of Yeah, it, you know, if we ended up buying something on our own, we, we, would, we would own it. Oh, we would. Okay. We would, yeah. If, if we paid for it, we, we had it 100%, we wouldn't make it part of this program. Okay. Yeah. I see. That's more language to make sure we don't have direct liability for Okay, okay. No, I'm just uh, curious. Yeah. Makes sense. Their responsibility. Yes. I just also have a technical question about the terms of the agreement. So in um, item eight, it references the um, termination clause of being 18 months. Is that a standard? It, it seemed a little lengthy at first read, but I was just curious if that's a fairly standard. You know, I, I looked at some other termination agreements and I looked at, you know, the, the budgeting and some of those issues and basically to get, it, to get it within the prep tour budget and then a year's budget. You know, particularly if, if there was, you know, some major change, you want to give the other side a notice. But, but you know, but there's also a provision that we can mutually agree to other parties. You know, we, get, we always have gotten along well with Scarborough, and I would expect that uh, we would work together on the issue. Other comments? Questions? Are we ready to vote? Wonderful, and we're voting again on, <clears throat> excuse me, approving the draft interlocal agreement. All in favor? Any opposed? No? Thank you, that was unanimous. Great, we'll move on to item number 47, the appointments committee report. Councillor Grennan, will you introduce us? Yes, I will. So, um, there we go. On January 4th, the council approved a purpose in charge for the alternative energy ad hoc committee. Um, the appointments committee, Councillors Ray, Councillors Garvin, and I were tasked with interviewing and selecting the five members of this new committee. Um, 18 applicants um, applied with varied backgrounds, knowledge, and expertise, and all um, were pretty incredible, actually. They were all passionate and um, incredibly smart and talented in, the, in this, this particular expertise in this field. Um, it was a very difficult decision on who to choose. And um, I will nominate in just a minute. But in the meantime, I want to let everybody know that the letters will go out tomorrow, um, thanking all of the 18 who applied. And, and I just want to, again, make sure that they know that um, we are so uh, pleased and thankful that they came out and shared, gave our time, and were willing to give um, their service to Cape Elizabeth. So with that, on behalf of the Appointments Committee, I move that we accept the following nominees to serve on the Alternative Energy Committee with a term until December 31st, 2016 unless extended by the council um, with a vote. Um, those five committee members are um, Wes Doan, James Massey, Lorenz Schmidt, Julia Bassett Schwerin, Schwerin, and Rick Smith. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks to the Appointments Committee for your hard work. I know it was a couple of long evenings. Do we have any discussion on this item? Yes. I just want to um, echo what Patty said. There could not have been a more um, impressive group of people that came forward for this, um, and the sheer number of them as well was really gratifying to see that many people expressing interest. I hope for those that um, were not selected that they'll um, consider other opportunities as they come available, because uh, we, we definitely saw um, you know, an extremely deep pool of talent for this and uh, some, some citizens that I think would really benefit uh, the town through their service and other roles. So it was just uh, very impressive and my personal thanks to all those people that applied. That's great. Thank you. Yes. I just want to um, thank uh, Patty for all the work she did putting it all together. She did a great job and same with Deborah. And, shepherding people in and out and you know there was they were all out here talking we heard, what is there a meeting out in the council no there was just people lined up 10 minutes 10 minutes 10 so minutes impressive. so um we were very lucky i've never been on a committee where we were looking for committee members and had so many mm -hmm. you know usually you're on the phone wouldn't you like to please you know apply because you don't have that many and it was amazing so 
Great job. Thank you. Great. Any other comments, questions? Are we ready to vote? All in favor? Any opposed? No? Thank you. I'll pass another, it to you another related committee. And thanks to everyone who applied. And I would concur with Jamie if you were not put onto that particular board or commission. There are always more opportunities coming along. Item number 49, proposed personnel code <coughs> amendment. Mike, I think you're introducing no, this one too? No, did I skip that? Oh. <laughs> How could I skip 48? I put a check mark. Oh, no. Too quickly. Proposed municipal budget. Mike, you'll introduce that and yeah, we'll have we'll, a motion. We'll, since you want to move right forward, I do. We'll, we'll move it along quickly. Uh, it's only 8 o'clock. I'm happy to present. You all have your budget books. Uh, the budget schedule is in front of you. Uh, the overall budget is proposed to increase 3.8%. Uh, revenues are proposed to 4.2%. And the tax rate will go up for municipal services, 10 cents for 2.4%. Uh, this will put together mindful that the school subsidy had decreased in the superintendent's original budget uh, that went to the school board. If you looked at all of these tax rates, would provide a 4.9% increase, which is a little steep. Uh, just to focus, the county continues to have a, a big impact on us. Uh, while the town tax rates up 10 cents for all municipal services, and commun including community services, the county in and of itself is up 4 cents, uh, which is, you know, you keep hearing from the county, well, it's a small piece, it's a small piece, but it's becoming a larger piece mm -hmm. all the time. Uh, it, it would, the other thing I'd like to say is, is that, you know, as, as I'm presenting the numbers, I'm treating community services as if it was in the budget last year, so that you're actually comparing apples to apples. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would like to say is that community services had an overall positive effect because their budget was virtually unchanged in, in total dollars, I, so it actually brought down the municipal percentage just a little bit when you add that much and don't have an increase to it. Uh, I would, the other point I would like to make is that it does address in the budget staffing for senior citizens and in particular to take a, a part-time person who, who works on senior citizen issues and makes them full-time and then to have a, another uh, person who, who handles very administrative type duties, admin duties, uh, and to make that person full time. So uh, it, uh, you know, I think it, it addresses those concerns and those issues in large part that were raised by the Senior Citizen Advisory Committee. Beyond that, it's fairly routine equipment replacement, uh, you know, continued uh, challenges with health insurance rates going up. Uh, but uh, I look forward to reviewing it with you and going over the details next week. Thank you. And for people who are watching at home, we have a March 1st memo here from the town manager with a really, I think, terrific uh, synopsis of all of that information. And thank you, Mike. Really well done. It's all online. Elizabeth.com. Oh, that's what I the meant to say. Link. Thank yeah. you. Yes, that is what I meant to say. Great. And do we have a motion? It is recommended that we send this to the Finance Committee. Yes, Councillor Sullivan. I move that we send the proposed municipal budget onto the Finance Committee for review. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Patty. Discussion? No? All in favor? Great. Thank you. We'll be meeting again next week to revisit that. And now we will move on to item number 49, proposed personnel code amendment. You'll introduce that one? Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank uh, you. What this does, it, it, we have a, a provision in our personnel code that if an employee doesn't take all the health insurance they're eligible for because they, they're covered under a spouse or partner's coverage, uh, that we give them a buyout to incentivize them to do that. What this amendment does is it says that yeah, we'll do that. However, if your spouse or partner has another position with the town or another or a position with the school department, i.e., the taxpayers are already paying the health insurance for the whole family, the buyout doesn't apply to you. You don't get the buyout. That's simple. Thank you. Yes. 
I move that we accept the proposed personnel code amendment. Thank you. A second? Patty? I'll second that. Thank you. Discussion? Yes, Sarah. Mike, I just have a quick question. So, <coughs> if, let's say someone works at Cape Elizabeth Schools and their spouse works in Portland, then they, and that person in Portland gets coverage, they can get a buyout, i.e. get cash instead of health care, correct? But if both work at Cape Elizabeth, then the second person can't get cash. Yeah, school, first of all, the school employees in and of themselves don't have a buyout. This is the provision in the municipal uh, personnel code. Okay. So this only applies if someone works in the municipality and they have a spouse or partner who either works for Cape Elizabeth or for the Cape Elizabeth School Department. But uh, that, that's the only instance. However, they still get to choose whether or not they want coverage under the town policy or the school policy. That option is still open to them. They just won't be, if they choose the school policy, they won't get the, the municipal buyout. What if they choose the municipal, do they get the school buyout? There's no school buyout. There's no school, okay. yeah, there's no school buyout. Got it. That was my question. Oh. Great. Other comments, questions? All in favor? Any opposed? No. We'll move on. Citizen opportunity for discussion of items not on the agenda. Yes. I'm a citizen. Um, I just wanted to um, say happy birthday to our town manager whose birthday is on Thursday. Oh, Thank you. Happy birthday. The big six off. Happy birthday. Thank, Thank you, so Kathy. Well. Anyone else have anything they'd like to add? I okay. Give people raise a glass to you that day. <laughs> okay. Uh, next up, we have item number 50, the um, annual evaluation of the town manager and collective bargaining. And I'm going to ask in just a minute for a motion to um, go into executive session. Before I do that, I just want to mention again to anyone watching at home, our next meeting, March 21st, will begin on the budget review. Um, it's the first of several meetings, but as the manager mentioned, we'll be meeting downstairs starting next Monday evening, 7 p.m. Thank you. Can I have a motion for going into executive session? So moved. No, I think by law we have to have it read. Hmm. Jessica, you can do it if you have that. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I move that um, in accordance uh, with, uh, I'm sorry, in conformance with 1 MRSA subsection 4056A, the town council hereby enters into executive session to continue the annual evaluation process for the town manager and in conformance with 1 MRSA subsection 4056D to discuss with the town manager collective bargaining with local 340 of the Teamsters representing public works employees. Thank you. Do I have a second? Thank you, Jamie. All in favor? We will move into the Jordan Conference. Very nice. 